Mic check, mic check. Okay. Recording start at 20. Hi everyone, Aylin here, and I have another new release book. I was actually talking about this one yesterday when I filmed for From Nothing to Chief Floor Officer at Citigroup. Um, if you've seen that one, then you'll know about this one. If you haven't seen that one, then go watch that Zero to Chief Floor Officer because it's a really good one. So let's dive trade in. C Bank. The Fall of the Banks. Dedicated to Helen Krakow. Gone but not forgotten. A woman who grew my mother to be a never give up warrior. This book has been a real war to write and finish. Finishing it is me winning the battle. Special credits. Mike. I would be here without my lover and provider. Um... Pamela, she inspired me to write this thing. Nurse Mama Bear pushed me to finish the damn thing and also got me inspired to write even more. Kiva stood next to Nurse Mama Bear supporting me in this war, this book that took six years to make. And to you for uh, listening to the book or uh, go pick up a copy for free. It's in the description. It's a freely downloadable PDF file. start with the prologue. The year is 1999. The world is in the middle of a cacophony of technological innovations erupting from inventors' homes and corporate laboratories. Oisung Technologies is no exception, but the owners of Oisung have ulterior motives in their technology. The owners of Oisung are tired of being the stuck-in-the-middle business. The owners of Oisung have many friends and family members living in poverty. The big banking industry just gets larger. Technology is flourishing as it has been for the last 10 years of the 1990s tech boom. The owners of Oisung want to take advantage of the tech boom and use it to change the way money works in a way so profound that it completely breaks the entire mold of economies and socioeconomic norms. A way of generating infinite wealth. How could that be possible? Find out by listening on. Chapter 1. The Machine is Born. The world of banking will never be the same. A dreary, dark Monday in Chicago at the Oisung factory in 1999 leads us to two men standing in front of a row of automated teller machines. David, a slim 70-year-old man wearing a black suit and slacks, exclaims to his 54-year-old business partner, Bert, who is wearing a blue IT nerds who stick nerds who fix stuff shirt and blue jeans we're finally finished we've revolutionized the American automated teller machine the machine will never be the same welcome to a new era in banking Bert looked over at the machine then looked at David a few times pondering the equipment he then turned towards David and said in a nervous voice What happens when people don't go to the human tellers anymore? Do we really want to be that company? The one that killed all the jobs in banking? <laughs> David chuckled at Bert, dismissing his concerns with a snide remark. Not our problem. Quit worrying so much. Get that machine loaded in the truck. <clears throat> Need to be at the Federal Union Banking and Regulations Conference before load-in time ends. Bert sighed as he walked over to a waiting pallet jack and wheeled it over to the pallet, lifting it with a touch of a lever. He said in an exasperated voice, You know what would really be nice? For once, not having to rush everything last minute. Actually getting work done on time or early for a change. David follows Bert as he wheels the pallet through a hall, lined with other machines. In the distance sits a blue armored truck with the Oisung logo on the back. It bore labels. No money inside. Empty banking equipment. Yet it was still no pleasant vehicle to drive. 
David stood at the back doors of the truck and ushered with his hands rapidly towards Bert, hurrying him. Come on, come on! Whining about us being late and moving slow isn't going to help. Bert casually retorted, slowing his pace even more as he put the four modules into waiting boxes. I'd rather be late than have a damaged machine, wouldn't you? After a few seconds, David glared at Bert with eyes of fire. Bert hurried his way to the truck, and with beads of sweat on their foreheads, they slowly pushed the heavy machine into the truck off of the pallet jack. David stood back, leaning on the door of the truck, breathing heavily. <sighs> Over his breath, he says, Craftsmanship. Inventiveness. Some steel and computer tips, and we have these marvelous machines. Bert was young and spry. He jumped into the passenger seat of the truck and yelled, Let's go, man! Enough being sentimental. Now you're literally standing us up. F.U. Bank isn't going to keep the folks from three-eighths entertained with new bill counters and counterfeit detectors forever, you know. We're only booked for a 4 p.m. meeting. And it's only a one-hour meeting. It's 9 a.m. now. We only have seven hours to make Minneapolis. That's a six-hour drive in good traffic. Lord only knows what traffic is like today. You know how much I hate having to floor it. David got into the truck. He leered at Bert and said, Who said you'd be doing any of the driving? I've got the lead foot. I will be getting us there on time, even if it means paying a traffic ticket. David and Bert slowly pulled away from the Oisung factory. The machine boxed up in the back of the truck. Bert peered through a small window at the machine, disassembled into four parts and boxed, his face turning to a pensive, nervous expression. David turns on a hard rock radio station and taps the steering wheel, waving in and out of lanes recklessly while Bert sits there, eyes fixated on the pallet strapped down in the back of the truck. The truck not much wider than the pallet, but there was still plenty of room for the machine to take damage if it was driven in a way unfit. And that truck was sure being driven in a way unfit, and Bert had something to say about it. He looked over at David and glared at him before loudly shouting in an angry tone, the tone you could only remember from that angered driving instructor in high school, a tone that makes your blood curdle and your spine tingle, your head hurt and your soul ache as his words crush your spirit and make you feel like absolute trash as a driver. Slow down, man! You are going to have the cops on us in no time driving like this. That or you'll kill us! David continued his dangerous maneuvers, justifying them with the brief statement of, No time for careful driving. We have to be at a few bank or we are done. A few minutes later, on westbound I-90, an Illinois State Police cruiser appeared behind them. The mood in the truck turned dark instantaneously. David's tapping on the steering wheel became a tight grip on the wheel. He slowed the vehicle, but it was already too late. The cruiser flashed his lights and bucked his siren signaling the armored truck that it had been intercepted and was being ordered to pull over. <sighs> David sighed and pulled over. The officer exited their vehicle and approached the truck. The officer, a burly, husky man with a belly that stuck out from underneath his Kevlar vest and made his uniform stretch, spoke in a voice that could make the whole freeway bridge rumble. What are you? An ambulance? You don't look like an ambulance. I'm going to need your license and registration, guys. You are 30 miles over the limit and driving recklessly. This is going to be a ticket at the least. I'll let you know everything once I get back from my car. The police officer walked off from the truck, leaving Bert and David to themselves. David rolled up the window as Bert looked like he was about to blow his cork at David. Bert broke out with an outburst. Now you see, David! Now you see why I hate being late! 
because we end up having to lead foot it, and it almost guarantees ourselves a ticket. David seemed unfazed by this and replied, At least Core Bank is in Chicago next week. What do we need FU Bank and Three Eighths for anyway? Bert quieted his voice and said, Because we can't accomplish the objective of Operation Crashed Banks without a large network of machines. You want to make lots of money. Crazy money, right? Then we're going to need a crazy amount of machines. Capiche? David let Bert finish speaking, and then his face turned as red as a fire engine. His ears looked like steam would come out of them at any second, and then he howled at Bert. You putz! Don't dare talk about the secret stuff in front of the fuzz, fool! That officer might be right outside the window. Sure enough, as David turned around, his whole body jumped, and the redness turned into a pale flushing. The nervousness of seeing the big officer in front of him, making him change colors instantly. David looked at the officer, his eyes wide with fright and rolled down the window a crack, saying, y You didn't hear any of that, did you? The fat officer chuckled. <laughs> listen, bud. I don't get paid to listen to people prattle on about how they have some fantastical plan to bring down the global banking system. It's not even in my jurisdiction anyway. And I frankly doubt you two could do something that big. I've seen your warehousing machines. You're that small teller machine manufacturer for the Midwest region, and that's all you'll ever be. What I get paid for is watching people like you drive like crap, and then pull them over and hand them tickets to make them pay for it. Now get out of here. Don't let me see you speeding again or doing anything stupid, or you and your buddy will be spending the night at Cook County Jail. The officer walked off and got back into his car. He pulled away and drove off. David and Bert gulped sweat beating on their foreheads. David rubbed his head with a used fast food napkin and tossed it off to the side. He slowly lurched the f truck forward, turning the music down. The atmosphere in the truck turned from the cold of the police pullover to an arctic tundra of stoic seriousness. Bert speaks with a tone so serious that you'd think someone's life hung in the balance that second. Too damn close, David. Way too damn close. As much as I like vacations, an all-expenses-paid stay at Cook County Jail is not appealing. David replied loudly, an argument beginning to form. Said the guy who spoke about our plot to take over the world in front of a damned cop. Bert's voice quieted. He took several deep breaths while David yelled. Bert trying to keep his composure above Dr David's frayed at best mental state. He spoke in a voice almost like a snotty nerd telling the net less knowledgeable math solutions. Listen, David. You make the mechanical stuff, the machinery, the housing and all of it. I put the computer in along with the code. That's how it works. Understood? I told you how the chip works, right? You best know this thing inside and out before we get there, as you're presenting it. David looked over at Bert with a split second before looking back at the road with a face of sheer stupor, and then he said lambasted, No, you didn't. And why wasn't I told of this early? All I've been told was it's a black box that's going to make us massive amounts of money. Bert reached into a box in the center console and pulled out an extra MSP chip. Bert began explaining the chip. Say hello to the main security processor. Or at least that's what the public thinks it is. This is actually the money-stealing processor. David concentrating on driving, only occasionally glancing over at Bert to assure him that he was paying attention. After all, he well knew what the chip looked like. Just a plain black integrated circuit, but he had no real idea of what it actually did inside of that black chip. David said in a quizzical expression, So you tricked 
the world into thinking it's a purpose-built cryptographic security chip when this thing is a whole second computer inside the ATM with command privilege. Bert replied quickly, Bingo! When we're ready to operate and do crashed banks, or codenamed C-Bank, we tell the control server to load the virus onto the machines. The code I wrote causes the ATMs to have intermittent errors crediting deposits. Say you deposit $20 to your checking account, the machine deposits the real money, but then it clones the money, sending a copy to our servers. It only gets $20 of real cash, but $40 of bank funds actually get moved at the back end. David slowed the truck to a crawl. He looked over at Bert like he was out of his mind and said, How exactly is this going to work? <laughs> the banks will get wise to what's going on. We are so going to get busted for this. <laughs> Bert chuckled and said, Get some speed back into this thing. Quit looking at me and drive. The chip's a liar, David. When it commands the ATM to alter behavior, the ATM thinks it's the Oysung control console that the bank uses to control its own machines. So, both their console and ATM will behave as if an employee punched in a faulty command. Lots of people are going to get canned for this. The whole banking industry will be on its head. David sped the truck up. He paid close attention to the speed limit signs, knowing that they were likely being watched. He had no time to spare, and no faculty in his mind to spare, for another police interaction. He said to Bert, Yeah, yeah, litching to take over the banks, Bert. Let's just get to our meetings at FU Bank and get them three-eighths to buy the machines before even breaking open the champagne. We also don't have a chance of this operation working unless we have Core Bank on board. Chapter 2 The Meeting at FU Bank the company's future, and the mission's future hangs in the balance. David and Bert pull up to a garage at the FU Bank headquarters in the early afternoon of Monday. The door is opened by an attendant. David shows the attendant his ID and his trade show load-in sheet. The attendant then says to David, mm, Pop the doors, please. David opened the back doors of the truck and said, One, two, three, four. Four boxes. The attendant said, Yep, you're free to go in. Go find a parking spot. David was not expecting a full load inspection. He nervously closed the doors and then drove into the garage, his face becoming that telltale pale as he once again was flushed with fear. They found a parking spot toward the far end of the garage. David and Bert stepped out of the truck, panting from the stressful drive and even the arrival. <sighs> David told Bert, Go find a porter with a pal, Jack. We need to get this thing to the meeting room. <sighs> Wish we had a closer parking spot. Although at the far end of the garage, David and Bert got lucky. An alcove leading to elevators to the office and showroom floors was nearby, and in that alcove was a small security office. Bert spoke briefly with the guard in the office, his, office and his voice an inaudible mumble from the office as David hopped in the back of the narrow, cramped truck and began unstapping the pallets from the floor brackets. Bert returned a few minutes later with a dock clerk wearing a bright orange vest. He is young, college age at best. He stumbles around the pallet jack's controls, bringing it to a screeching halt near the doors of the truck. He speaks, Eh, what's up, guys? You the two o'clock from Oisung with the machine? Bert spoke back, putting his foot forward defensively. Yeah, we're Oisung. Don't mess up our machine, kid. I can tell you're young. Real young. Either working a high school second job, or working a college job. You breaks what's in these boxes, I break your entire future, kid. The dock clerk spoke back in a confident voice. I'll have it up to Tushar's office in post haste. It'll be up there before you even get up there, old man. Let me get the door for you. 
After all, elders first, he said sarcastically, leading the men into a sterile, modern office environment. David sighed with relief at the sight of a washroom sign and said to Bert, I need to go wash up so I don't look like crap as I'm trying to sell a weapon of mass financial destruction. He disappears into the bathroom for several minutes. A toilet flush and the sink running are heard before he emerges from the bathroom, tidying his necktie. David spoke in a slightly happier mood. Pretty convenient that the dock clerk let us in through the back of the building. How do I look now? Bert replied, What did you do in there? Brush your hair and put on a new scent? David chuckled. <laughs> Gotta look good and smell good to sell. Bert looked at David with a strange, crooked-eyed look and said, Let's just get this damn thing sold. This part of the project is the one that's the most nerve-wracking. David and Bert peer into the window of Tushar's office after arriving upstairs. He's inside on the telephone. A few minutes later, he hangs up and comes to the door, opening it, greeting David and Bert. His office aide rolls the machine and boxes into the office. Bert quickly slices the boxes open and assembles the machine's four modules. Lacking a screwdriver to bolt everything together, it'll just have to function set together. Bert plugged the machine into a wall outlet, and the screen scrolled through the usual motions that any computer of the 1990s would. White text on a black screen, scrolling as it ran all sorts of machine commands that no average person would really care to look at. After it finished starting up, the Oisung logo showed, and it loaded up into the standard banking operating system. Tushar smiled slightly and said, Great to see you, Tu. I'm eager about this new technology for our bank. Out with the old, in with the new. David kept an eye on the machine. He didn't trust anything not screwed together. Bert seemed more interested in Tushar than anything else. Bert seemed to not care that their future was sat haphazardly slapped together without a single screw holding it together. One wrong move in the whole machine would be knocked to pieces. David, not taking his eyes off of the machine, put his hands up to the screen and said, this is the new Oisung 3000, and it is what your bank and every bank needs. It is upgradable, yet conforms to the federal requirement that an ATM be a sealed machine. Bert got excited and shouted, Upgradable CPU! Upgradable GPU! Memory! Storage! All of it! Just like a regular computer! Tushar cocked his head and said nervously, what about viruses? We need these machines to be extra secure. When the government transitions us off of Milnet to the civilian internet, civilians are going to want the money. Civilian hackers will figure out how to get the money. Bert grabbed an MSP chip from his jeans pocket. He held it up to Tushar. Tushar was shocked and immediately said, That. That is the, 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 the new security chip everyone is clamoring about. Bert replied energetically, Yep, this bugger generates two million random number combinations per second. Only one of them is a transaction hash, though. David started to sweat. He looks over at Bert with an angry glare and speaks over him, cutting him off. Blah, blah, it's basic crypto chip with a high-power random number generator, nothing much. Let me show you around the machine and how it works. David demonstrates the machine to Tushar using a demo card. He withdraws and deposits some simulated currency before depositing a demo check. Tushar's mouth dropped open when he saw the screen saying, Check deposited, and he heard the loud thunk of the armored door closing, the whir of the transport belts moving the check to a secure storage drawer in the machine. Tushar said, Did, did you just deposit a check without a banker? I'm impressed. Also, the touch screen is much faster. Hard key buttons and black and white screens are out. It's not a gas pump. It has to be high tech. It has to look great. It has to grab consumers and have them wanting to use the machine. 
David responded with roadside salesman enthusiasm. Full colors, 480 by 768 wide screen, touch screen, flat screen, LCD in there you're looking at. State of the art. There's only two companies making these screens. Us and a company making hospital monitors. You won't see anything like this in a consumer's hands for at least five years or so. And it won't be cheap then. Need I forget to mention remote check capture and deposit. Tushar was less impressed by the widescreen HD screen than he was at the fact that David had deposited a paper check into that machine, something that had never been done before. He reached over to his telephone, holding his hand over the handset, saying in a highly professional, important tone, I have Greg over from three-eighths. I think he's going to need to see the machine on the double. He then releases his grip on the handset, opening the microphone, and then shouts down the phone line as soon as Greg picks up his mobile after sat ranging for several rings. Greg, get up to my office. Quit sucking on the coffee maker. Greg responded as Tushar pressed a button on his phone, projecting Bre Greg's voice into the room. What is this about? I'm entitled to my coffee after a four-hour flight with nothing to eat or drink. Dushar said in a hurried tone, shuffling papers across his desk, making room for his bulky laptop computer that sat in a bag on the floor behind the desk. Remember the guys from Oisung I told you about? Greg responded quickly and snidely. <laughs> the guys with that state-of-the-art ATM is going to change the industry? Yawn. We all know the new Sonotech ATMs are the best. Tushar replied, Sonotech my ass. Won't you look at this soy song machine? You'll think Sonotech is making toys. Get down here. Greg replied three simple words before hanging up. Be right there. Chunk. The phone clicked. Tushar set his handset back on the cradle after hang Greg hung up. Moments later, Greg came quickly walking into the office, out of breath. Greg closed the door of the office and dripping sweat from his forehead. Breathing heavily, he leaned on the wall, looking at the machine, and then at Tushar, David, and Bert, expectantly. He then sat down on a spare chair on the side of the office, breathing heavily. Well, I ran the whole way here. What is it? Show me. Show it to me. Tushar introduced David and Bert and explained that they had built the new machine that had sat in front of Greg imposingly. David spoke to Greg. Remember the Oisung 2000 that came out in 1984? Say hello to the Oisung 3000. Bert takes over the role of demonstration leader, showing the machine to Greg. He says, Let me start by showing you how much faster and easier it is to make transactions on the Oisung 3000. He deposits and withdraws cash, then deposits a check. This makes Greg immediately shout, Blazing fast! Awesome graphics! Users are going to flock to these machines! Sold! David pulled the briefcase out of one of the four boxes. In it was a plethora of paperwork for almost every conceivable situation in the business, all the way up to the red folder, so that David and Tushar could quickly dissolve the company and abandon in a hurry if needed. He pulled out a green folder that was labeled Sales. He lifted it up to his nose and sniffed. Ah. I love the smell of a freshly printed sales order. And a sale. Bert said, So, Greg, Tushar, while David gets the paperwork sniffed and prepared, how many of these do you need to be rolling to your banks? Greg replied, staring off over at David as he pulled pens and more forms from the folder in a flurry of excitement, saying, uh, let's do an initial roll of 2,000 next Friday. 25,000 machines on the street by New Year's. 
Tushar spoke next in line. We've been your biggest client since the Oisong 2000s, since besides Corbank. I know it's a stretch, but can you get 5,000 to me by next Friday and 35,000 by New Year? David and Bert back up, back to back, and giggle like teenage girls in excitement as Tushar ushers them out of the office. David and Bert turn around, and David says with a smile, It's done, man. We're working for three eighths and Foo Bank. Let's go back and get their stuff shipped. Bert looked at David and said, Aren't we going to wait to get our machine back at the end of the show and, like, I don't know, go see the Robble Bank and Sonatech displays and all the other exhibitors? David replied in a hurried manner, We didn't come here for a symposium. We came here to speak to the director of this thing. We aren't here to woo the consumers or the branch managers. We're here to woo the corporate directors. And honestly, RoboBank, RoboBank, Sonotech, Sonotech, whatever, do they have nothing I'm interested in. Bird agreed and stated, Fine. I'm driving us back to the factory, though. We cannot afford another ticket. They drove back to the factory and arrived to Chicago very late at night, pulling the truck into the factory's parking lot. They got out of the truck and abdicated to their cars to return home, neither of them paying any attention to the wide-open garage door entrance of the building, a telltale sign of what is to come of the Oisung facility. David returned home and sat down in his bed. He stared out of his window, thinking, Fuck. I'm sure I forgot something at the factory important. Yeah, whatever. He slowly drifted off to sleep. Chapter 3. Building the Order. Will they ship in time? Bert and David meet in the morning on the balcony above the factory assembly floor. Multitudes of men wearing special clean uniforms for handling sensitive electronics rush around the factory floor, noisily assembling the machines. The shouts of people asking for refills of particular parts and other chips were audible across the floor. David said to Bert with a smile, I can't believe we did it. 60,000 machines sold in one day. Bert looked around the factory floor. He had seen it full of equipment but he had never seen every station manned before. The massive factory was jam-packed with workers. Bert said, Where did all these guys come from? David explained, I pulled them in overnight from our other facilities. I think Oisung is going to be exiting the appliances industry and go all in on banking. Bert said in a nervous tone, grabbing at the back of his neck, I hope this is enough manpower. We have to crank out 7,000 machines in a week. David replied, Nothing to worry about. We're sat on half a billion right now. We'll be turning it into billions when the sea bank worm hits. Bert gulped and said, Right, but what do we do after we steal the billions? David exclaimed loudly, spinning around. We disappear! Oisung goes belly up, David dies, Bert dies, and we come up with new identities as Jason and Dylan. Then we fly over to England and partake in the slightly slimeballish game of stock market trading on the LSE. Bert said, All great ideas. Right up to the point of dipping our toes into yet another quasi-illegal game. Stock market manipulation? Really? David replied, Oh, and your sea bank worm isn't a money manipulator? Come on, man. Bert replied, We'll get to that when we get to it. For now, let's just get this shipment out. Seven days pass in almost no time for Bert and David the factory workers assembling machines, while some workers package them and load them onto waiting trucks. The next week, David and Bert look out over the factory floor 
as workers load the last few machines onto waiting trucks. David leans on the balcony railing and says, sighing, Whoa, what a stressful week. Bird exclaimed, I haven't slept in three days this week. Tell me about it. David said, Neither have I, Bert. Neither have I. We need to be well rested for the core bank meeting tomorrow in the AM. Bert got a glint in his eye and said, Hey, we haven't hit up a bar in a while. Guys here will finish everything up and get the last of trucks on the road, so by tomorrow the first few machines will start trickling into the branches. David laughed weakly. <laughs> almost sarcastically and said I'd love to go bar hopping but I really need to make these machines make sure these machines ship Bert responded tiredly suit yourself I'm going home getting some shut eye not typical of you to decline a bar trip Bert left the factory leaving David alone on the balcony David stood there for a few minutes, then pulled a cigar out of his suit pocket and lighted it. He puffed on the cigar a few times and scoffed to himself, speaking. <sighs> Bar hopping on one of the most crucial nights. <sighs> Man needs to learn where alcohol time is and when it's time to just have a cigar. He stepped into his office, a large, drab 1970s build-out. Multiple desks sprawled the office. His desk was closest to the windows facing the street. During the day, this office was a flurry of men and women making phone calls and moving paperwork for parts orders and service and sales orders. Now, it was a silent place where David could take some much-needed time to relax. David sat at his computer, puffing his cigar. He dials onto the internet and checks his email, deleting several spam messages spanning pages on his browser. He uh, comes across an email from Tushar, his face with an annoyed glare on it after going through all the spam. He reads it under his breath, under his breath against the smoke of the cigar filling his mouth. Oh, David, Tushar here. We are waiting to know when to expect our machines to arrive. Let me know how Greg's order is as well. He will be staying here at FU Bank for the week. David replied to the email, telling Tushar that both orders are being finished up as he types the message, and that the trucks would be rolling out by 9 p.m. After hitting send, David, exhausted, shuts off the computer, puffing on his cigar until his stub singes his fingers. He drops it into the ashtray, exclaiming, Damn it! He put his head down on his desk, the exhaustion and tobacco's effect making his head spin. A factory worker knocks on the door, startling David, who jumps up sitting. He yells, Come in! The factory worker, a young man, not older than 25, walks wearing a blue jumpsuit made of nylon. He says, Just letting you know that the last truck is loaded now. You can go home. You look beat. Dave replies exhaustedly, Thanks, man. I am beat. I need to rest before tomorrow's big meeting at Corbank. The worker tried to start some small talk. Talk at the water cooler has been about that tick you guys got driving out to Grand Rapids. Lay off the lead foot, huh? David grew angry and slammed his fists on the desk and said in a seething with rage tone, You want me to lay off your 401k? I can pull your 401k in a minute on this computer. Don't you know how rude it is to talk about other people's driving blunders at the freaking water cooler? Get out of my office before you lose your retirement package. The factory worker darted out of the office shouting, I'm sorry, I'm out of here. The door left flung wide open. David staggered to his feet and left the office. He walked out of the main doors, 
a long walk from the back warehouse. He watched the last truck leave the warehouse garage, the door closing with a clattering thud. He locks up late in the night, arms the security system, and walks to his car in the foggy dark. Driving home, he swerves to avoid an unusual animal in the road. David goes straight to bed after arriving home, walking straight through his house without even noticing the flashing light on the answering machine nor the flashing light on the alarm system. Little did he know that his house had been burgled and something very important had been taken, something that would alter the course of Oisung permanently. Wednesday morning, David awoke, his mind far clearer. He noticed the bedroom television was crooked on its mount and still turned on to the game console, the dim screensaver icon sliding across the screen. David became suspicious that something had happened. He quickly pulled on his suit, skipping the shower. He reached beneath the bed, grabbing a machete. He walked out of the bedroom and through the halls of his house, shouting, I'm armed! Anybody in here, I'm going to stab him! The first place he went was the second floor office. He scrambled down the stairs as fast as he could when he saw that his folder containing several engineering documents, classified, had been stolen. David began to suspect that some sort of high-profile organized crime network had struck his home. He walked out of the house, armed the security system, and locked the door as normal. That is when he noticed the lock didn't work at all. He went back inside and noticed that the alarm system didn't arm. David called the police department's dispatch center. An operator answered, 9 emergency, what's the address and the nature of the emergency? David replied, my house, 19th Street, it's been burgled. The locks don't work. The, the operator cut him off and said, David, of Oisung, get to the Oisung factory straight away. It's far bigger than your house. We'll send the police there next to secure the building. They're waiting for you with the fire department at the factory. David's heart began racing. The moment he heard fire department, he knew something serious had happened at the factory, and whatever it was could not be good. David rushed through his morning routine, slapping together a cup of coffee and throwing his shirt and slacks on before running out to his car and speeding to the factory. End of part one. Editing sequence. Splice here. <laughs>